I'd like to call the meeting to order. At this time, we'd like to ask Councilman Bruce Conk to lead us, I'm um, sorry, uh, Councilman Bellard to lead us in a prayer and Councilman Conk to lead us in a pledge. Lord, you have trusted us as stewards of this parish. Please guide our hearts as we make decisions. May we always be mindful of our service and seek you first in all that we do. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag. All right. Thank you, Councilman Bellard, for the prayer. Thank you, Councilman Conk, for leading us in the pledge. And we'd like to welcome the community and those who are attending this evening's meeting. Hopefully everyone uh, turned out all right with the showers and the, the storms. And uh, look forward for that to uh, kind of dis dissipate and uh, have some good weather the rest of the week. Moving forward, we'd like to go ahead and get the meeting uh, started. We welcome you to the City Parish Council meeting. We, as your representatives in Lafayette Consolidated Government, welcome your involvement and encourage your participation. This meeting is a public hearing. If you wish to address the council on any item on this agenda, please fill out the request form in the foyer on the computer that we have provided. The electronic request to address the council form must be filled out and submitted prior to the call of the agenda item or you will not be given an opportunity to speak. If assistance is needed within submitting the request, staff is available to help you. In the event a speaker has completed their comments prior to the expiration of their allotted five minutes, or if we have answered all of your questions, any remaining time shall be forfeited. If you have materials you wish to submit to the council, please give those to Ms. Um, our council clerk, Ms. Veronica Williams, who's seated to my left and in the middle. In an effort to allow everyone an opportunity to be heard, the five minute rule will be in effect. Speakers shall refrain from debating personal attacks and from making confrontational or derogatory comments. I'm requesting that the first row to my left be used for media only. And lastly, food and drinks are not allowed in the auditorium. And at this point, we ask that all phones and electronic devices shall be silenced moving forward. I'm also requesting that anyone who approaches the council, please state their name and title for the official record. Meeting procedures are by resolution and not by Robert's rules of order. Documents including agenda, ordinances, resolutions, and minutes related to this evening's meeting is posted online at lafayettela.gov, or you can refer to the web address on the top of the agenda. The council encourages your involvement and participation by volunteering for boards and commissions. If you are interested in finding out which board suits your interests, we ask that you call 291-8800 or pick up a pamphlet at the door. We will move to chair announcements. I'd like to announce that item 8, resolution R38-2018, relative to a distance requirement waiver, will be delayed for consideration per the chair's privilege, which is mine, and will be addressed immediately following item 12, which is the conditional use permit request for the same property. That would be item 8. Item 9, resolution R39-2018, relative to the notice of the certain, uh, notice of the creation relative to the notice of the creation of a fire district has a proposed amendment to provide for format changes in the title and body of the resolution and include a proposed boundary map of the backup per the request of the legal department. Item 12, final adoption of ordinance 061 2018 relative to a downtown conditional use permit has a proposed amendment to add additional conditions which require the establishment to be open for service no less than five days per week and to continue to serve food on all days of operation per the request of council member pat lewis item 13 14 15 and 19 final adoptions of ordinances number 062-2018 063-2018 and 0-76-2018 relative to surplus properties 
have proposed amendments to remove the words advertisement of from the final section of each ordinance. Item 25, alcohol appeal for the office bar is being withdrawn per the appellant's request. That's item 25. Item 41, introduction of ordinance number 087-2018 relative to 701 Lewis Arsenal Road rezoning is being pulled from the in global list at introduction for a separate vote and discussion per council member Lewis at his request. Item 43, introduction of ordinance number 89-2018 relative to surplus property is being pulled from the in global list for separate vote and discussion due to a proposed amendment to remove the words advertisement of from the final section of the ordinance. Now that we have all of that out of the way, I would like to wish Carly Amabar, Development and Planning Director, a happy birthday, which she will celebrate on June the 15th. Carly, Carly happy birthday. All right. And I don't have any personal chair announcements to make, so at this time I'd like to move forward to the council announcements. And at this time, I give the floor to Ms. Councilwoman Lizzie Bear. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, they are going to kill me, but I have some very special guests in the crowd today. Uh, my coming all the way from Mineral Point, Wisconsin, is uh, my beautiful nieces and nephew that are in town, and they've decided to spend part of their first week of summer vacation with us tonight. So. Uh, I do apologize. No. <laughs> But uh, Abby, Ellie, and James are here with their mom, Susan, who's my sister-in-law, and my brother, Bill, is watching from home. So thank you guys for coming. And of course, my mother is here as well with them. So just wanted to say hi to them. So right. everyone be on your best behavior. We'll my mom is here. All right, and that's all I have, Chairman. Thank you. You're welcome. That's, that's quite, that's, yeah. Councilman Cohn, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, there's been some, in the news lately, some conversation about the sheriff bringing a tax, a sales tax proposal on the ballot in December. And I, for one, as one of nine members of the council, have had little official notice of that action. So what I'm requesting tonight of our clerk is that she invite the sheriff to our next council meeting to provide us with details. And Part of the news articles that I've read have indicated that perhaps there is a potential of the Lafayette Police Department sharing in that revenue. Again, having no intimate knowledge about that, I would ask the administration to chime in on that at the next meeting. And if that is the case, then I would also like to hear from legal about what are the steps that need to be taken to assure that that does happen. I'm talking about the sales tax ball and contribution to the Lafayette PD. So if we could have all that at the next meeting, because I think he has to take action no later than July 10th. He has to actually serve notice within the next week or so of the intent to have the election. And I, for one, would like to know what's going on. Thank you. Okay. Clear the floor. All right, any other council announcements? Seeing none, at this time we'll move over to the Executive Mayor's President's Report. I'd like to recognize our Mayor President Robido. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I do have a proclamation uh, to read for Social Media Day. It's a globally, globally recognized celebration that acknowledges the many technological advances that have enabled people in our community and local businesses to communicate, connect to real-time information, and share content in the hopes of getting their voices heard not only locally, but regionally, nationally, and globally. And whereas social media builds community morale by providing news and important updates via social media platforms, whereas these platforms are widely used and recognized throughout the city of Lafayette and surrounding municipalities, and whereas many citizens as well as local businesses are using these platforms to schedule, advertise, hold meetups, and other community events at various local city venues, getting our community and community leaders moving while educating them on the use of social media and how to effectively use these platforms to further 
the prosperity of local business while moving our great city forward in economic driven markets such as shopping, tourism, festivals, and future residents of Lafayette. Whereas the goal for Social Media Day is to connect people in the community by creating an event that combines social media networking and face-to-face -face interactions to offer a great opportunity for bringing our community together while celebrating how social media has allowed us to share our unique culture, food, festival, music, and businesses with people all over the world. And whereas June 22nd is Social Media Day, BBR Creative, together with our local businesses in Lafayette and surrounding areas will gather together to educate community members and business leaders on the benefits and strategies of using social media by providing classes, speakers, and networking opportunities throughout the day, concluding with an evening social event for professionals and enthusiasts alike. Now, therefore, I, Joel Robino, Mayor President of Lafayette Consolidated Government, do hereby proclaim Friday, June 22, 2018, Social Media Day. I'm not sure if anyone was here. Yep. Also, there's a um, University Avenue corridor. The final public meeting uh, on the Gateway Corridor is Tuesday, June 12th from 6 to 8 p.m. at Bridge Ministries, which is 512 North University. And then I think there's a couple other items that I'm not handling. Uh, Laurie, are you doing the budget to actual? Sure. All righty. Item B is the monthly required budget to actual comparison for all major funds for actual activity through April of 2018. You may recall that's part of the new procedures for the statewide auditing procedures. So the auditor will know when he sees it in the minutes, we really do do this. <laughs> and then last, I think Thomasine is here for a bid. Oliver, Thomasine Oliver, Purchasing Manager. This is an LUS inventory item, therefore I need council approval to award this to the lowest bidder. Got a motion by Councilman Boudreau and a second by Councilman Conk. Not seeing any other discussion. Go ahead and call the vote. I'm sorry, is there any public comment? Okay. Yes. 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 Is my name. Yes. Yes. District 6? Yes. District 7? Yes. District 8? Yes. District 9? Yes. Motion to award bid is approved. Okay. Is that it, Mr. Robodeau? Okay. All right. I'm going to move over. Kevin. Oh, that's right. Uh, at this time, I'm going to recognize Councilman Terry Yohid. Uh, wait, all the mics are still on, V. Hit your button for me, Mr. Terry. Okay. All right, you have the floor. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Thank you for allowing me to uh, speak out of turn. Just a quick uh, FYI to everybody. I had a couple of individuals that had contacted me, and they, they seemed a little distraught, and they kind of explained the situation. There was an, an event, whether it was paid or, or not, a free event, where at the Cajun Dome, I guess this, it was um, uh, a couple of weeks, two or three or four weeks back, they were standing behind an elderly individual, um, this woman, had had a, a very difficult time just walking through the front door or walking to the steps of the door and when she got there of course they were doing the searches as they do and uh, unfortunately this individual had a bottle of water in her bag that she was walking in with and the two people behind were very upset because they took her bottle of water and they took it and told her she was not allowed to have it and basically told her she would have to go in and pay five dollars for a bottle of water if she wanted it so the individuals that contacted me said look we know that there are some instances where people bring things into the Cajun Dome we know that they're not supposed to but when it comes to the elderly um, it just really 
made them and a lot of people around who saw the incident feel very bad about it because they don't know the financial position of this individual. But I just wanted to bring it up to the administration. I don't know if there's anything that can be discussed on, on the issue, but or if there's some kind of waiver for the elderly. Um, maybe that's something we can look at. Um, but anyway, I just want to bring that to everyone's attention. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's all I have. Okay, no problem. All right, moving to resolutions. This is a public hearing and electronic sign in is available for anyone wishing to address the council. Just keep in mind that we have a five minute rule and it does apply. And Jeremy, can you read the first resolution? Resolution 35, 2018, a resolution of the Lafayette City Parish Council designating the daily advertiser as the official journal for the Lafayette City Parish Consolidated Government for one year commencing July 1st, 2018. Okay, need a motion and a second. I've got a motion by Councilman Boudreaux and I got a second by Councilman Pat Lewis. Any council discussion? Seeing none, any public comment? Yes, we do have one speaker, Clifton Lafort. Good afternoon. My name is Clifton Lafour. Um, I'm the local advertising director for the Daily Advertiser. I certainly appreciate your time to speak just briefly in front of you this evening. Um, as you know, we are re or seeking out the bid again this year. Um, the Daily Advertiser has been uh, a newspaper in this market for over 150 years. Uh, we started our first publication in September of uh, 1865. And so proud to be uh, certainly be a partner and to contribute uh, to the local community. We have um, we also have a digital platform that produces uh, 474,000 unique visits a month. Uh, we also deliver 2.5 million page views a month, as well as 1.4 million uh, mobile views as well. Uh, the daily advertiser. Uh, does a lot of work in the community. Uh, we are participating in the sports awards, which we also had at the Cajun Dome just recently, uh, as well as the best of. Uh, something else we do for our readers is we have an empowerment series, which really tells stories about local people in this community and things that they deal with so we can connect. Uh, primarily, our function is to connect an audience, and uh, we're certainly proud to continue doing, doing so. Uh, we appreciate your um, your continued support, and we, we want to be involved with this local community. And we hope you'll consider, again, for 2018 through 19. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Councilman Terrio? Yes, real quick. Mr. Robidon, I don't know if you or Ms. Toops would like to address this, but um, in the past we've had questions that this has always been awarded to the advertiser and that there are stipulations that this government is required to do and advertise um, and that there may not be other institutions or organizations available other than the advertiser at this point that can provide us with that service. Is that a correct statement? Thank you. Yes, yes sir. Um, state statute, if I'm thinking about this correctly, state statute dictates the publication and it has certain requirements that have to be met for the publication to be our official journal and the daily advertiser is the only one currently that meets all of those requirements. That's what I thought. And one final question, Thomasina. Mm -hmm. What is the annual dollar amount that LCG gives to the daily advertiser? I looked it up today for just the ads that we do in the daily advertiser. It looks like about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a year. Okay. Thank you so much. That's all I have. Okay. Councilman Cole. Oh. <laughs> you getting excited, man. <laughs> you got it? All right, now you got it. There we go. But just for the record, it's not just ads. It's minutes of all the council meetings, all issues that we have to meet legal requirements. So that fifty grand is on the low end. It could be well over two hundred thousand from what I understand. Right. Let's make sure we get the story straight now, right? <laughs> All right. Clear. Any other uh, public comment? Yes, sir. Okay. Go ahead. Please call the roll. District 2? Yes. 
District 3? Yes. District 4? Yes. District 5? Yes. District 6? Yes. District 7? Yes. District 8? Yes. District 9? Yes. District 1? Yes. Motion to adopt is approved. Resolution 36, 2018, a resolution of the Lafayette City Parish Council authorizing non-warranty cash sale of the property at 317 Nottingham Circle to an adjoining landowner pursuant to Louisiana Revised Statute 47-2202B for the price of the sales anticipated costs. Got a motion by Councilman Castillo, a second by Councilman Boudreaux. Council discussion. Councilman Boudreaux, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to very quickly uh, commend the department, the legal team, and all those associated with this particular resolution, as well as seven, and a couple of ordinances that's going to come late in the meeting, 23 and 24. Members, you're going to see that this is the first um, of the adjudicated property process going forward. Um, something that has been worked on by this government for well over probably 25 years, multiple councils, multiple administrations, in the attempt to get properties back into commerce. And um, we, we have two here um, under Carly's leadership in the planning uh, department. We, um, we, we, we created a pilot. Um, and this is two of the first four that falls into that category. And, and I just wanted to again commend them for their efforts. This has been a long, long time in coming. Um, a lot of work has gone into this. Uh, and we hope that this process is successful for those people who are being granted here today, as well as the organization being granted. And, and I hope that when they come back in a matter of a couple of months or so, when, when the process is complete and an award can actually be made at that point, Lafayette would then have become successful at getting properties that were not uh, being collected upon taxes that were not being collected back onto our roads um, in an active way. In addition to that, what this does for those communities that have been negatively affected by these properties, it brings light back to those communities. So this, this Lafayette needs to be proud. This council needs to be proud. All those who worked on this matter uh, should be very proud. And I just want to say thank you all for uh, the effort that you put forward. Thank you so much, Councilman Boudreaux. Councilman Lewis. Thank you, Chair. Um, like Mr. Boudreaux was saying, I appreciate everything that had been going on. So when I became on council, which is about 26, 27 months ago, people had been asking me about the adjudicated properties. But I have one question, if Carly or someone can answer the question. It's about the uh, non-warrant cash sale. Exactly what is that? And I want the people that's here that's interested in buying adjudicated property to understand what that means because I'm sure they, in case we have some other stipulations that, you know, I just want to make sure they understand. I want to understand myself. Yes, sir, Councilman Lewis. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Ryan Gowdlock. I'm an assistant city parish attorney, and I've been um, uh, fortunate enough to help work, help uh, Carly and PZD work on the uh, disposition process for adjudicated properties for some years now. And again, we're, we're very glad to be bringing the first of those to y'all's attention. I believe that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Carly, I think the acquirers, the proposed acquirers for each of these properties are here this evening. So uh, they'll, they will benefit from the councilman's question and from hopefully what will be uh, uh, satisfactory responses. So the, as, the, as you're aware, Mr. Lewis, the non-warranty cash sales and similarly the non-warranty donations uh, the first in the case of adjoining landowners and the second in the case of the nonprofit, which is Habitat in this case. These, uh, these sales and these donations are titled non-warranty because on their face they disclaim any liability of LCG for defects in the title of the property. Essentially what that's intended to do is to insulate the government from any uh, untoward uh, uh, possibilities that the the person may have encounter with the uh, clarity of the title or with uh, issues with former owners or issues with successors of former owners or any other issues that the acquirer may encounter in their use development investment occupation ownership of the property so that's intended to insulate LCG from um, any backlash by the acquirers of the property because uh, our interest is getting these properties back into commerce, not in exposing ourselves in the process. 
Uh, and that's what the statute allows us to do is to, we, we don't own these properties, LCG does not own these, we never have, and we never will. What we can do is we can sell them and we can donate them based on some very pretty strict requirements, but we, what we don't do is uh, incur liability for issues with the title to those properties. That's what the non-warranty part's all about. So if I'm understanding correctly, LCG does not own the property. And, but we can sell it, that's what you're saying? Yes, sir. We don't that's own it, but we can sell it. Yes, sir, that's correct. And, that's then, exactly and right. then will these people, whoever's here that's interested in buying these adjudicated property, do they own the title? Yes, Do they sir. still have to open a, a succession, or they can just buy it from the city, uh, from the government, and then they, they own it? That's, the statute allows us to sell property we don't own. It does sound counterintuitive, and donate it, too. Uh, what essentially the statute, and this is a state law creation that we have an ordinance that the, the council has long since passed to allow us to do it. The state, the theory that the legislature undertook was these properties are adjudicated. They're long since tax delinquent. So when that happens, when they go to tax sale, they're called um, bid in for the taxes that are delinquent on them. That doesn't transfer title to the governments whose taxes they're owed on because then we'd have liability for them. We'd have to insure them. We would have to make sure we'd have to fence them. We might have a liability if someone were injured on them. So we do not own them. They're, uh, they're fictitiously bid in for the taxes to the governments that are, uh, the taxes are delinquent for. So the legislature's theory was, well then in that case, since they fictitiously own them, let's go ahead and let them sell them or donate them so that something can be done with them. The, the acquirers, in the case of the buyers, the, the, uh, the vendees, and the donees, in case of the donations, they undertake whatever measures they need to notice the appropriate people, and the notices are very, very uh, detailed and set out in the ordinance governing this process. They undertake the cost and the uh, and the effort of making sure that the proper notices are given for constitutional reasons, uh, because this is a deprivation of, of property, even if it's a tax delinquent property. So the acquirers have to undertake a, a pretty arduous notice process to make sure that the constitutional rights of the delinquent taxpayers are respected. Uh, but they do undertake the risk of that process, its completeness and its, um, and its uh, thoroughness. And uh, so they, they can do quiet title actions. They have to do, take certain notices, which we require them to, because again, our point is to make sure the process works, is to make sure they do get clear title. Otherwise, uh, we've wasted their and our time. Well, I'm, I'm in support of it. I just had these few questions, and one more if I may ask. Yes, sir. Well, if they decide to acquire these properties, can they sell it, resell it? They, if, unless the council, uh, the council can impose whatever conditions on the sale, donation, or transfer of these properties as the council sees fit. So written into the deed is not a requirement that they cannot resell. Uh, for, for nonprofits, for example, the Constitution says they have, to, uh, uh, they have to renovate and maintain until they do reconvey, and that's aimed at nonprofits like Habitat. For a sale like this one, a sale to an adjoining landowner, there's not a requirement in the deed that they can't resell it. The council could if it wishes, and we let this open, and we let the default be that there's not a requirement on that. However, if the council saw fit, it could impose such a requirement that the acquiring adjoining landowner must acquire for a period of, or retain, sorry, for a period of X years before they can reconvey it, and that could be attached that that would amend the resolution and that the resolution itself is recorded so that if the acquiring landowner tried to go around that, sell it immediately, flip it, whatever, then the, it's in the public records that they're not permitted to do that. And there the council can also revoke in the case of a violation of those deed restrictions. So the default is that they are free to reconvey it but the council has the, uh, the, has the power at, uh, when it passes this resolution or these ordinances, the transfer, that authorize the transfer, to prevent that from happening on whatever conditions the council sees fit. So, you know, if for example, there's a, an adjoining landowner here and the council is not concerned about their good faith, is not concerned that they're, uh, 
that they're going to try to make a profit or flip this or take advantage of the process, the council may choose not to do that. The council may choose to say, okay, you know, we, don't want to, we don't want to burden you unnecessarily, understand. If it's a sensitive piece of property, however, if it's in a sensitive area, if the council has heard uh, from constituents about we need to be concerned about this, we need to step, we need to tread carefully, in that event, the council could amend the resolution of the ordinance to include a condition that would ensure its use and its reconveyance didn't happen uh, except to the council as, as the council sees fit. Does that make sense? Sure does. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Councilman Terrio. Quick question. Uh, is this process done by the bid process? And if so, is it a public bid, private bid? and who all is involved and uh, who can participate in, in that process? Yeah, great question, Ms. Terrio. For these resolutions, the statute lets us sell to adjoining landowners, meaning what it sounds like, people whose property uh, is adjacent to the adjudicated property. It permits the sale of the property at the cost, of, at the cost incurred by LCG, which is pretty minimal, in the absence of public bid. That's so these, these two resolutions involve applicants who have gone to PZD, filled out applications, worked with PZD staff to let them know, here's who I am, here's where I am, here's my affidavit saying I've maintained it for a year prior, which is a requirement of the statute and the ordinance, and basically jump through all of um, PZD's hoops to satisfy the statute and the ordinance. Those folks... Um, in the, in the circumstance of an adjoining landowner sale, it is not a public sale. The statute uh, allows that. There are um, sales which, sales to anyone else, let me put it this way, sales to anybody but an adjoining landowner are by public bid. And that can be, um, that's a PZD policy determination, but that can be a courthouse step style bid process, that can be mail-in, that can be, the only thing that we cannot do, which is in the ordinance, is internet auction. Any other modality that PZD seeks to do a public sale, they can do, but they, those do have to be publicly bid sales. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, one final thing you'd mentioned earlier, I think, with Mr. Lewis, is that uh, we may want to visit um, looking at some of these people, the investors, Yes, sir. especially if it's not the uh, adjoining landowner, but make them required to maintain that property or hold it at least for a certain amount of time before they can roll it over and uh, make money on it? The council has the power to speak, obviously to ask those folks to appear and also to question if, if uh, the PZD staff who work with the applicants to help them with the paperwork, show them what they need to, uh, let them know what they need to produce, uh, get the paperwork from them, walk them through the process. That's the the ordinance calls that person in PZD the administrator. That's the designee of the director of the department. So the council could also have input from the, the PZD staff who have worked with the applicant. If they have input about the location, whether there's a sensitivity as to the location, hmm. the, uh, the nature of the acquirer, that sort of thing. So both of those sources could inform the council on policy, policy calls like that. And while I understand the goal of this is to make sure that we get these properties taken care of, uh, get them to where they're in, in uh, commercial activity again or on the assessor rolls. So yes. we don't want to do anything to the detriment that would discourage somebody from getting involved in these pieces of property. It's a balancing process. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, it's a balance. Yeah. We, we have to strike a balance between ease of acquisition versus making it stick. Gotcha. That's all I have. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Councilman Terry. I mean, Councilman Boudreau. Thank you. Um, with, with the questions that are being presented, I was just going to suggest um, that maybe if an updated version of, of where we are can be presented to the council in its entirety yes, um, so individuals could see. What I will ask um, tonight, um, Carly Ryan, whoever chooses, is to kind of explain what we're doing now. I know it's kind of a two-step process. And to Councilman Lewis and Councilman Terry, your question about any uh, stipulations and whatnot, we're giving authority to the department to move. Then there's a lot that the interested parties who have went through the, the application process have to meet, inclusive of um, uh, developmental plans and, and other things that has to be presented. So they have to meet all of that activity at the departmental level. Then the final, the final disposition, um, as I understand, is to come back to us for that approval. And that would be 
when we see, when they present us, what this landowner intends to do. So if the adjacent landowner is simply trying to expand his or her yard or footprint, allow for in-yard parking because they was possibly in a neighborhood where lots was 25 foot wide or something like that, we'll be able to see that. Um, we still have all the protections of the zoning code um, as it relates, so it's, it's not as if somebody can acquire and then all of a sudden do something that is, um, uh, not consistent or not approved through our code process. So we still have the protection of zoning. This doesn't circumvent zoning at all. Um, we, we still have, you know, all the, the protections of um, neighborhood plans that have been approved through the planning commission, everything related to the UDC, uh, coterie work. So all of that still remains in place for communities um, that, that are heavily impacted. And the protective measures is we have the final say. And, and arguably someone could present a, a plan that may not fit into LCG's overall plan and it could be rejected. But um, I, I just, I don't want you to go through everything tonight. Right. But I think to, to their issue about, you know, where do we go from here? Maybe you could just touch on that. Yes, sir. And I might ask Ryan to chime in towards the end, but a couple of things just to clarify. Um, as Councilman Boudreaux, I think about a year ago, we adopted some uh, amendments um, that kind of allowed our adjudicated property ordinance to, I guess, be finalized and be ready to take on, um, to take properties through the process. And so late last summer, we, um, we elected to launch a pilot program because anybody who's been living next door or near these adjudicated properties knows what a, what a nuisance they can be, but also how difficult a nut this is has been to crack for our community I mean we've never really put adjudicated properties back into commerce and so we needed the landowners and the applicants to understand we were using the word pilot because we we knew it was going to be a long process um, so we had probably about uh, um, I don't recall the exact number but I'll say about 12 applicants apply for the pilot we haven't rejected nor do we plan to reject any there's just some are going to go through the process faster than others so these were the first four that are ready some have to be further further vetted to to go forward and we're happy to come back and make a presentation and kind of talk about the three different types of or i guess four different types of property transfers you might see tonight you're going to see two of them with the adjoining property and the donation and I actually I'm going to ask Ryan to clarify but I think for the purposes of tonight the plans for the property are actually in there so tonight you guys are approving those plans yeah. and you know if you, you'll need to just make sure that we can all get to a level of comfort because this is the council's opportunity to weigh in on that and Ryan can clarify can clarify the process for that um, but yeah that's that's where we are um, and you know just also really want to thank a couple of members of my staff Kathy Gilbert Kirk Trahan and Katrina Katrina Porter, who have worked really hard to even get us to this evening, as well as the landowners and applicants who have been really patient through this process, because this is not something you do. The people that we are working with are not doing this. They're doing this because they need to do it, because the properties are causing real stress in their neighborhood, or in the case of Habitat, because they're trying to continue their good work. So, The only thing... Um Thank you, Carly. The only, Mr. Boudreaux, the only thing I would, I would want to clarify to your remarks was, as Carly, as Carly mentioned, the, the council's called upon this evening to uh, approve resolutions that include the, uh, the deeds, essentially the non-warranty cash sales and non-warranty donations Councilman Lewis asked about. If there are conditions, if the council seeks to impose conditions on those uh, transfers, then the council should do so on the floor this evening. Uh, what happens, the process from next steps from here for the acquirers is, you're right, Mr. Boudreaux, that they go through a, a bunch of hoops once the council were to approve in terms of notice, in terms of signage, in terms of mailing, in terms of publication, all of these uh, protections intended to avoid an unconstitutional taking of property. But once they do that, though, to the satisfaction of the PZD staff, of the administrator, that, at that time, the administrator is then authorized to authenticate the sales, essentially to, to submit them to the mayor president for execution. So upon presentation of the resolution is the appropriate time for the council to uh, avail itself of any input that it wants as to the properties and, and impose any conditions it sees fit. Yeah. just want to make sure that that, that y'all were clear on right, that. Right. I saw it in the packet. Um, I guess 
it's been a long process. Right. I know we, we kind of gone and, and maybe it was from a previous that we would get two shots at it, but did see it in the package and I'm, I'm certainly fine with what I have saw. But I, I knew that the council, at the end of the day, I knew that we had the ability to thumbs up or thumbs down a yes, proposal, sir. which I felt that's where that authority should lie because we know what's going on in those neighborhoods, especially when they come before us. So every uh, transfer does come through the council. Right, every, every, and in this yeah, fashion. It has to be approved. Yes, sir. Some by resolution, some by ordinance, depending yes, on what type of sale it's going to be. So, yes, sir. But again, I, I just want to commend you guys. Um, I, everybody may not have the appreciation yet, but when you look at the demand for affordable housing, and at the same time trying to build market housing without expanding that footprint of affordable housing into areas that, that would not allow us to, to develop um, economically and, and retail-wise because of some of those factors. When you look at the impact on our school system as far as populating these communities, um, the, the overall quality of life and condition in neighborhoods and communities, this, this is a game changer. Getting and, and for us, as, as we know the difficulty of, of collecting taxes and, and with all of the issues related to taxes, there, there's, there is a significant amount of money out there just of properties that are not paying. So when we get folks to acquire these, get them on the road and start paying, years from now I think we're going to see um, a significant impact when we start collecting to the tune of 25%, hopefully then 50%, then hopefully it's gonna come a day where I could come back and visit this place and somebody gonna be sitting up here talking about, we don't have an adjudicated property in the parish, all properties are accounted for. So again, thank you guys very much for your efforts. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Councilman Lewis. Yes, uh, two more questions. Who said the prices for these sales? Just a bid. You process. all you, set the prices other, set the than price. the, other than the bid. Okay, if these two pay item pass tonight and someone else would like to purchase adjudicated property next week, next month, next six months or a year or so whatsoever, can we do what Mr. Pujo was talking about or what you had mentioned earlier of set standards? Or it doesn't have to be set tonight for these particular uh, properties tonight. But later on, someone else come to the council we can set the, the, the standards then? Yes, sir. Standards? At a, uh, I think I understand, if I understand you right, at any time the council can pass, could, for example, amend the disposition ordinance to say, this applies in every case, this applies in certain cases, okay. et cetera. Uh, also, when the, council, when the council, again, has to approve or disapprove every transfer, at that time the council can impose conditions on that particular one, okay. every time. Does that answer your question? Yes, because this is a pilot, and again, I'm, I'm content with this in here. Okay. But then the next one may yeah. not be, exactly. you know, what we want. So the, if we can set standards on the next ones or move forward. On basis. a per transfer okay. basis. Okay, that's, yes, that's fine. I'm, I'm good with that. Okay, thanks. Okay, not seeing any more council discussion. Any public comment? Yes, sir. Uh, we do have one speaker who signed in who did not wish to speak but supports the resolution. And we do have one speaker, Demarcio Wiltz. Demarcio Wiltz? Did you want to speak on it? Okay. He passes. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and call for the vote. District 3? Yes. District 4? Yes. District 5? Yes. District 6? Yes. District 7? Yes. District 8? Yes. District 9? Yes. District 1? Yes. District 2? Yes. Motion to adopt is approved. Resolution 37, 2018, a resolution of the Lafayette City Parish Council authorizing non-warranty cash sale of the property at 202 Estiva Road to an adjoining landowner pursuant to Louisiana Revised Statute 47-2202B for the price of the sales anticipated costs. Need a motion and a second. Motion by Councilman Boudreaux. Second by Councilman Conk. Any council discussion? Seeing none. Any public comment? One speaker signed in, Michael Ducey. Did, did you want to speak on the item? I just, I just thought y'all might have some questions. Okay. I said only if you have questions. I'm good, Mr. Mike. You you good? We we we. <laughs> we I'm not a real good speaker, so uh, 
<laughs> been on it a long time. Thank you for being here. I'm glad we can make it work for you. All right. Go ahead and uh, call the vote. District 4? Yes. District 5? Yes. District 6? Yes. District 7? Yes. District 8? Yes. District 9? Yes. District 1? Yes. District 2? Yes. District 3? Yes. Motion to adopt is approved. All right. I'd like to remind everyone that the item 8 will be addressed following item 12. So move to item 9, please. Resolution 39, 2018, a resolution of the Lafayette City Parish Council, State of Louisiana, providing notice of intention to create a new special fire, fire district in said parish, describing the boundaries thereof, ordering and directing the Mayor President to give due notice of the proposed creation of said fire protection district, providing for the hearing of any and all objections to the creation and boundaries thereof and providing for other matters in connection therewith. And a motion by Councilman Castillo and a second by Councilman Conk. I have to announce that we have, uh, legal has proposed an amendment to fix errors in the title and body of the resolution and add a boundary map to the backup documents. Uh, Mr. S. Scott, can you speak to that or do you want to comment on that? Um, unless you have a question, I mean, I, th I think it's just a matter of what's shown in the red line as well as the maps that, that is attached is for reference only. Okay. All right. We have a, a, a motion to uh, offer the amendment by Councilman Boudreaux, and I have a second by Councilman Castillo on that amendment. <coughs> Looking for council discussion on the amendment. None. Any public comment on the amendment? We do have one person signed in. I'm not sure he wants to speak to the amendment or the resolution as amended, but Brian Champagne. Mm -hmm. Champagne, I'm sorry. Brian, you want to speak to the amendment or you want to wait to see if the amendment passes and speak uh, to the resolution yeah, we'll as amended? Okay. No other speakers. All right, let's call the vote on the amendment. District 5? Yes. District 6? Yes. District 7? Yes. District 8? Yes. District 9? Yes. District 1? Yes. District 2? Yes. District 3? Yes. District 4? Yes. Motion to amend is approved. Okay, now at the time, Brian, if you want to speak before we vote on the uh, resolution as amended. Brian Champagne. Oh, I'm sorry. You want, William, you want to? Uh... Yeah, maybe with a Okay. Okay. You want me to? You want to ask the questions, then let him speak, or you want him to go ahead and speak, and you want to? Okay. Uh, Brian Champagne, um, the president of the Lafayette Fire Protection Association. Um, we've been working with several y'all for many years to try to get a sense of funding uh, to fund the parish. Uh, so we do appreciate this being brought to the table tonight. Uh, I know it's only the first step in many, but um, it's a start. Uh, so with that said, you know, all the uh, fire chiefs in the parish do support this, um, this revenue of funding that we are um, trying to go after. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mr. Terrio? All right. Uh, my question will be to, I guess, uh, either some of the authors of the bill. We want to be very clear as to what this is doing here. This is not at this point, from what I'm told, I could be wrong, but I haven't had too many discussions on it. This is not calling for an election at this point in time. Uh, which one of you guys want to give some kind of a breakdown on exactly what it is this is doing? Like, Eric, if you want to come. Go to the other mic, please. I mean, I can chime in too, but I'll, I'll let Eric take a crack at it. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, Mr. Chairman, somebody had a question. Yes, my question is, could you go ahead and explain to the council and to the public exactly what this particular uh, resolution does? Does it call for an election, or is this just calling for a, um, a meeting or a combination of minds in order to investigate and study the issue? 
So in order to create a district of any kind, but particularly a special uh, fire protection district, uh, the statutes provide for certain things that you have to do just to create the district. So this is not an introduction of a tax or a tax proposition or anything like that. It's just to create the district itself. As proposed, the district would cover basically the entire parish except every municipality. So it would be everything but the municipalities. So tonight you would just give notice to the public that you intend to create this district. And then on June 19th, you will have public comment with regard to the boundaries of what that district should be. And on that same night, you don't necessarily have to do it that night, but typically you would adopt, um, after you hear public comment, you'd adopt what you want the boundaries to be. And then you would adopt on that night a resolution in which you give notice again, but this time it's called the notice of formation of the district. Tonight you're just giving notice to the public that you intend to uh, set up a district. Okay. I want to be clear, and Mr. Champagne, you guys, I want to be very clear. I've always supported public safety, but my question <clears throat> and concern about this is that is this actually the way to go? And the reason I ask this question Tonight, I'm gonna ha I don't have a problem supporting you guys going out and actually creating this district. But when it comes back, that's where we're gonna have some additional questions, is that the unincorporated continues to shrink. Youngsville, Bruce R. Karen Crow, Scott, Dusan, and Lafayette continue to annex at a great pace. The unincorporated keeps reducing. You look at the pie compared to 10, 15 years ago, what the unincorporated looks look then as compared to now it has i mean my god it has drastically been reduced um, a number of discussions and i'm just going to throw this out there is that another option instead of doing this and and the reason they bring this up is that even if this were to pass and it goes to the people and it were pass they would say in a year or two because of the annexations that we would be in the same boat again it would not be providing fire department or the taxing district with the amount of funds that the millage would be generating from the initial get-go because of the annexations. Would you as the bond attorney agree that the more individuals we lose to another municipality, the lesser amount you would receive? Well, it depends on, let me begin, let me tell you too that you don't have to have a vote to create the district. You as a governing authority of the parish would create the district. I agree, I agree. I agree. But, but the, uh, the governing, the district in and of itself could not impose any fee or any, any ta uh, tax whatsoever unless the public voted on it. Right. So you still have to jump through that process. Right. Which... But, but if it's, well, so my point is if it's property tax, uh, you know, it's, it doesn't matter who's really, it's, it's based on the property and not population. But if it's going to be a unincorporated area, a taxing district, only in the unincorporated, what happens when one of the municipalities annexes one of those areas in the unincorporated areas? Well, then that town, now they, that homeowner and property owner falls under that class rating of that town that annexes. So what I'm getting at is the, the amount generated, or that will be generated, will not be the same. It will be reduced. Right. Because those individuals who are now who used to be the, in the unincorporated, who are now in another municipality, will no longer be paying that property tax. In order to be incorporated into that district, you would have to get the permission of the, the council. Usually you do those by an intergovernmental agreement to let those people out. Other so, than the city of Lafayette, no other, no other uh, municipality comes before this council to annex property. Lafayette tells us this is the amount of property we're annexing, but no other municipality comes in and does that. Now, whether it's through an agreement or not, we don't see that. I never have since I've been on the council. It's only if you have an overlapping district, it will be a little bit different, yeah. Because it's a political subdivision of the state. For example, you could not, if this district is created and they have to purchase firefighting equipment to try to drive down the, uh, to increase or improve the fire rating, once that, uh, once that uh, issuance was made, the bondholders would not let you deprive them of that revenue. So um, you would have to have a vote and approval to take an overlapping area. That would become an interesting uh, scenario. It, it, it happens, not often, but it does happen. You typically can do it through intergovernmental agreements. 
where that portion of the revenue from that particular area, for example, would go to the city's, uh, if it, if, for example, if the city annexes a portion of the, the district. area. Right, exactly. Okay. As Mr. I'm going to let Mr. Escott chime in. He's, uh, Mr. Chairman, maybe I can, uh, getting back to your original question, I, I think what your, your point is well made, and it is correct, that as the various municipalities annex, the unincorporated areas of the parish shrink, which essentially translates into the uh, shrinkage of the available people paying that millage assessed by the unincorporated special fire district. However, it also reduces the number of customers that the unincorporated fire district has to service. So it's almost a one for one. Uh, you may have a thousand people paying that tax and a thousand people have to be serviced. And at some point you have 500, but only 500 now have to be serviced. So the cost probably translate equally in terms of loss of revenue and, and decrease of operational cost. If, it, if that makes sense. Yes, I understand what you're okay. saying. Thank you. Um, one final question. This all came up kind of quick, at least on my end, that I know about it. Uh, but from what I understand, uh, this gathering of minds here in order to, um, or doing what we're doing here to create the district, doesn't this have to come back before the council like within two weeks to meet the... It has to, you, you have a 15-day window and you have that, that's all met, so are the publications, yeah. And moving so fast on this is no concern to you as bond council? You, you have to do it within two weeks, no matter whether you do it this month or next month, it's a two week process, yeah. The publications have to be done uh, within a 15 day period. I understand what you're saying. What I'm getting is in order to meet the next election, which I think that would come up in December. Oh, you're we, talking about an election, right? Yes, the election. The window we have is, I think, by the end of June, is that correct, or is it July, in order to meet the December election? Because it's too late for the November one. In order to meet the next date, you would have to call for the proposition and adopt it on August the 7th. However, there are, as the oral notice, the published, the- Right, right. Now, the law did change this year. But, um, <laughs> As a result, in part for having to have a call, a special meeting, we did change the rules from 30 days prior to the meeting to 20 days. Um, so that makes it a little bit better. But the way we have it scheduled here, you would have to adopt it on August the 7th. So you have, you have plenty of time. Okay, so to finalize this, basically what the council is doing tonight is we're giving the go ahead to create a taxing district. Right, you're creating a tax, taxing district without, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, a, a special, <laughs> it's a special it's, it's a special it's a special fire protection fire district. protection district so, for the yes, unincorporated exactly and you have plenty of time to consider whether how you want to proceed how you want to set up the govern governance of the of the district itself well mr boudreau just to follow up but anytime a district is created where there are boundaries set it is always some kind of tax, whether it's a TIF or it's a pilot or it's a, uh, a fire protection or some kind of uh, some some other kind of recreation tax district, you can say that. But usually, but when you define boundaries, you're going to be implementing some kind of charge. Under the Home Rule Charter of Lafayette, however, the final decision will rest with the the council. Yeah. Okay, that's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Okay, thank you. Before I give the floor to Mr. Boudreaux, I just want to make sure that everyone is aware that this is not something new or not something that was just created overnight. Uh, myself, Councilman Bellard, and Councilman Castile have attended several parish uh, meetings, association meetings over the years. My committee looked at it, at the funding source. We saw the issue. We've made cuts to the, the fire departments in some of the small towns. Some of them took a 60-something percent cut. One municipality didn't respond due to that. Uh, this has been an ongoing situation that uh, needed to be addressed. Um, we recently uh, had paid money for a study to be conducted to find out what's the parish looking like for fire protection. So um, 
this has been talked about in the media this has been talked about in public this has been uh committees we had uh committees over a year open to the public i mean uh by no means this is something that we just cooked up overnight and we're just trying to jam it down someone's throat this is a real life situation i attended a fire this past year where a young boy lost his life and the response time was like 26 minutes and we had a volunteer station around the corner that has continued to try to get volunteers and it's tough and it's not their fault they're trying to do the best they can with what they have and i commend them for doing as what they can with what they have and we're trying to provide the same equal protection that the folks in the city of lafayette scott broussard youngsville Dusan, karen crow have you know our lives in the unincorporated areas are just as important as those that live in the city or small towns and if you live in the unincorporated areas you are paying higher homeowners insurance if nothing gets done if this taxing district which mr terrio related to is not a taxing district it's a fire district we're creating the district if nothing happens if nothing comes to the council for a proposed solution it stays formatted in the, in its current form so we can do something or we could leave it as an open district and deal with it later down the road the bottom line is if we don't create this district if we don't show intent that we're trying to fix the rating then when they come in to rate us it's potential we're at 5.99 city of lafayette's a class two other towns are threes and fours we don't do anything we don't show intent that we're trying to help the unincorporated areas and, and create this then you go up two points you go to a class seven that's all of, right off the top an average of 250 dollars or more on your homeowners as a resident and probably more if you're a commercial business in the unincorporated area. So these are things that have been talked about. These are things that I've met with the association, met with the chiefs, met with our chief, met, met with administration when he got the, <coughs> sends a budget down and have to make cuts. So I mean, this is not something that this council, or that I'm gonna take lightly because the unincorporated area is one of those areas that is relying on, a, on us this council administration to try to fund what we can those towns are not obligated to respond as we know one town didn't respond and then we had to have the city of lafayette drive from the city of lafayette to fight fires in the unincorporated area north of i-10 now if you own a home out there your home is your investment it's where your family lives i don't think you want to wait 20 30 minutes and watch your house burn and then you're going to ask the question well why is this happening well what's going on I know it's going on, so it's my job to bring it and address it. What this council wants to do with it, what the public wants to do with it, the bottom line is I'm doing my job, and it's not popular because you have to talk about things that people don't want to talk about. But the truth is there's a dire need for fire protection in the unincorporated areas. And to do nothing is just not, it's not right. I have to sleep at night. So... Please remember that what we're trying to do is create a district, and that's what it is tonight. What comes in the future, we will have discussion, we will talk about it. But this was not something that myself or the authors just cooked up overnight. Every council member is invited to public meetings in all of those committees that we put together, and is all invited at these fire association meetings. Every one of us gets an email with an agenda and anyone can attend i have been attending i've been listening that's that's where we at and that's what what's on the on the ballot i mean on the ballot that's what we have here tonight okay I'm not going to run from it I'm not going to hide from it things have to be looked at and things need to be done however it comes about mr budro you need a Councilman Terrio. Yes. Uh, Mr. Nakan, no, and I surely was not saying that you guys did anything real quick. What I was getting at is that what has thrown a few people off is that this would come up for a vote in December. That's what I meant by it coming up very quick. Because I know you guys have been having meetings and discussing this for a while. And by all means, look, I want to make it very clear that the the volunteer people that we have in the unincorporated work in the fire departments are a godsend. 
individuals who take time away from their parent, their their families to 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 attend to other people's emergencies and needs. So we all understand that. But with this right here, and I'm not going to call it a taxing district because I've been I've been uh, chastised for saying it's a ta taxing district. So it's a new fire district that is, from what I was, I've understood, is that it every individual in the, this new unincorporated fire district will be charged an additional seven plus mills property tax in order to fund it. So when I interchange the property mills and taxing or fire district, that's what I'm getting at. When people see this, that is their verbiage, not mine. Because if it's gonna, if somebody's gonna have to pay an additional amount, it's a new tax and they call it a new taxing district. So the individuals right. that I've talked to in the unincorporated, that's what, what they have said. So yeah. um, maybe um, uh, not a good choice of words for me to call it that, but I'm just relaying what individuals have told me if they're paying additional taxes it's a taxing district right so anyway no disrespect but um, oh no and i'm not i'm not upset at all look i appreciate that very much and and i guess those people that are considering it looking at it as a new tax i would like to say that they've been getting service basically for free for all these years where everyone else in the city yeah. of lafayette and small towns pay some type of property tax for fire protection the unincorporated area has been relying on the general fund and has no dedicated funding at all so it's in their opinion and in their eyes and you're right it, it's it's a new line item so to speak but at the same time it becomes everyone else in this room that lives in the city of lafayette or other towns they all pay for fire protection so i mean it's either we 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 have to look at what are we willing to invest in that area in the community and that community is going to have to decide i want to pay higher on insurance than i want to do on on this i mean I just, the future is not bright because of the annexations is what you talked about. And the thing is, we're continuing to decline and decline. And those towns are not obligated. If they start losing money and they say, it, we can't respond, then, then our unincorporated areas has to decide, is it worth looking at a new, new revenue stream or is it worth just paying more in insurance? I mean, insurance companies are going to have a field day. They're going to be calling around for rates left and right. You know, so I mean, I I hear you. I just I think that the the truth needs to come out that the services have been getting completed and been taken care of for free. No, and and look, the individuals that I spoke to that have been my ear, just they their thoughts are that they have been bombarded by the state level, by the local level, asking for new taxes, and that's just really, really um, it's unfortunate. Causing them concern. I, I hear you. So, and as for the unincorporated. Because we have no businesses, and maybe Mr. Conk will get this later on with the parish things, uh, and I've said this before, Mr. Bellard and I have had these discussions, I think a few of us have had these discussions. The only real fix that I see for the unincorporated because of what's happening with annexations and businesses and every municipality that does a snake line to grab anything that comes up that generates revenue is the unincorporated is going to have to be broken up into pie pieces and every municipality is going to have to get a piece of it. That is the only way that the unincorporated is ever going to be able to survive because if it continues to shrink. But that would be the only way they wouldn't have to pay a new taxes if they get absorbed. Well, it's something that we may need to look at because if you look at the numbers compared to what it was 10, 15 years ago to now, common sense would tell you that because of the annexations and the businesses that are leaving, that is really the direction that we need to be looking at so anyway that's another issue uh i'm i'm finished here thank you mr narco that's okay. all i have thank you sir councilman Kong. i was intending to make this observation and please understand it's not contradicting what mr terrio just said but when we talk about the unincorporated area it's no small number it's 30 percent of the entire parish population that translates to nearly 70,000 people who reside in the unincorporated area. So let's please keep that in mind. This is no small number of people that we're discussing tonight. Thank you. All right, not seeing any more council discussion on the resolution as amended. Uh, can we call for the vote, please? District five? Yes. Yes. District seven? Yes. District eight? Yes. District nine? No. 
District 1? Yes. District 2? Yes. District 3? Yes. District 4? Yes. Motion to adopt as amended is approved. Okay, now move to reports and discussion items. Go ahead and please read. 2017 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report of Lafayette Consolidated Government by Burton Colder with Colder, Slavin and Company, LLC. All right, at this time I've given the floor to Ms. Laura. Do you want to chime in or you want them to go ahead and kick it off? No, nope. kick it off. Okay. You want me to leave your mic hot in case you have a question or in case something comes about or you want me to? Nah. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Nakan, and thank you, members of the council. Uh, my name is Burton Colder, and my partner is uh, Brian Jobert. We're here tonight to uh, discuss the results and summarize the results of our audit of the Lafayette City Parish Consolidated Government for the year ending October 31st, 2017. Um, just a, a few items, and I know y'all have gotten the com comprehensive annual financial report, which is 273 pages. We've tried, as we've done in the past, to give you some exhibits that we're going to try and hit some of the high spots tonight. And um, so that is all before you. In the report, the, consol the comprehensive annual financial report on page two is the auditor's report on the financial statements and the report that has been issued is the best report that an auditor can give you. It is an unmodified or clean opinion on the financial statements. Also included in the report is on pages I think 270 or 271 are some, uh, some items that we mentioned internal control findings that we had. We had two internal control findings this year that we mentioned and these of course management's comments as far as what they're doing to correct these issues are also included in this report. The first item of internal control was relative to the fuel cards and how they're being used and monitored and uh, we made some recommendations there as I said and uh, management has responded. They're in the process of correcting it. I think it states that it should be corrected or modified uh, as we discussed uh, within six months uh, of the year end. So I'm sure it's going to be shortly. The other item that we had was relative to some communication charges that were made to the uh, sewer department and to LUS Electric. And those items, um, they had some, some uh, charges that were being made that were approved by LUS uh, personnel, but some of those services uh, had been discontinued, but they, they had never told fiber about it, so to speak. So there was a, a control issue there that, again, that management has looked at and Terry and his staff have looked at and it is in the process of being corrected and may have been corrected as we speak today. The third item that was mentioned is relative to a management letter comment that we're making and that's regarding the contractual um, uh, charges that are being made and to look at those items and see if there can be a, maybe a better rate that can be charged uh, relative to LUS and LUS fiber uh, on those intercompany or inter interdepartmental charges. And again, Terry and his staff, I think, have already corrected that issue or looked at that issue and are, are in the process of doing so. That being said, let's go ahead and look at, at exhibit. I'm going to skip around on some of these exhibits and let's go to exhibit number two. If you will turn to the booklet that we've handed out. And these are excerpts from the comprehensive annual financial report that we're presenting. And um, so I just, I'm going to try and hit some of the high spots, but please interrupt me if you have questions and, um, and we'll try and certainly answer those questions. Exhibit two uh, depicts the financial statements or the income statement or the statement of revenues and expenditures for the general funds of the city and of the parish. As you know, you're mandated to have two separate general funds, one for the city purposes, one for the parish general fund. We've talked about this in the past. And you have comparative numbers here with 16 and 17 presented. Let's start with the city's general fund and you can see the 